good morning good afternoon good evening and on behalf of uh, hearing madras indian research foundation and the merck institute of speech and hearing i would like to welcome the chair the guest the panelist and the audience for this global round table discussion on audiological services during the covid-19 on the 26th day of june 2020 now i would like to introduce the um, uh, chairpersons of the round table discussion today uh, professor dr wolf data bomb gatna is a chairman of the hearing group and he is also the elected president of the collegium otorino laryngology and sacrum 2020 He is a university professor of ENT at the Medical University of Vienna, and he is also the university professor of ENT at Karolinska University, Stockholm. And I would like to introduce Professor Dr. Mohan Kameshwaran. He is a founder hearing member and the managing director of Madras Ear Research Foundation, Chennai. May I now request Professor Dr. Bom Gatna to introduce hearing to this wonderful audience from 14 countries across six continents. Professor Bomgartner, over to you. Hello. Uh, yeah, here. Good afternoon from Vienna. Here it is one o'clock in the afternoon. Thank you very much, Ranjit, for this wonderful organizing and to invite all of us all over the world. And it is a very, very important topic. Just a very short comprehension. Uh, we found the hearing. We founded the hearing over ten years ago. as a come together of the most excellent otology audiology departments all over the world in the meantime we are over 25 clinics of excellence and we, we are the people who set the standard so we have all together an experience of far more than 100000 cochlear implants of far more than additional 10000 implantable hearing aids and also some 100,000 otologic procedures all together in combination with the audiology and so we want to be the people or we we are the people who make the standards to help other people to join us and what we want to do we want to provide the best care for the patient the patients are our main focus and we want to help also smaller departments maybe not so well experienced departments to make the best out for the patient additionally we have a very strong scientific focus so we publish a lot of papers there are some hundred papers out from our groups uh, worldwide for surgery for audiology for bera for rehabilitation for cochlear implants but not only cochlear implants implantable hearing aids also otology cholesteatoma classic ear surgery and we want to provide a certified standard for the patient worldwide and it's also now our our mission to help the colleagues worldwide also in the era of covid and the coronavirus we had already over a month ago a very nice web meeting and we want to continue this for a get together for experts and all the people who are interested in the field of otology and we want to fulfill this mission with all our heart and i'm very very thankful to all of you and we are a wonderful group of people we need to be together for all the patients who are suffering a lot we will see this in this in this uh round a lot of patients don't want to come to the hospital and it's very difficult to to maintain all the services we are used to and we need to be here for our patients and this is what we need to do and i think it will be a wonderful meeting just a very short thing for one minute uh in vienna we we did a kind of anti corona solution it's a disinfectant and and it's it's here uh, peter did some some slide fortunately it's a cold of silver nitrate acid and also a iodine solution for the nose and we hope it will also prevent us and the patients for corona but this was just just a free of charge information and please let us now start with this wonderful meeting and to all the colleagues i'm happy to see you all i don't repeat the names but i'm really really happy i'm really happy to see all of you good luck and let's start the meeting now thank you bomi thank you so much for this nice introduction about hearing and 
I would like to introduce my beautiful panelists uh, who has taken their time off to share their experience and expertise to enlighten us on this wonderful uh, roundtable discussion on audiological services. And I would like to thank all of them for uh, taking their time out. And I would like to introduce um, Professor Dr. Meg Dillon. She is an associate professor and the director of cochlear implant clinical research in Department of Otorhinolaryngology, head and neck surgery at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She earned her doctorate of audiology in 2009 and is currently pursuing her PhD in hearing science. She conducts clinical research investigating the effectiveness of cochlear implant in new patient populations and individuals individualized mapping techniques for cochlear implant and electric acoustic stimulation services. Uh, uh, welcome, Meg. I would like to uh, introduce um, uh, Dr. Dais Chawara. Dais Chawara completed her PhD on cochlear implant, unilateral deafness, and brain plasticity at the School of Surgery, University of Western Australia, and obtained her doctorate at University of Florida in USA. Dais has experience across three continents in the areas of diagnostic audiology and hearing implant. She is the head of audiology at the Fiona Stanley uh, Fremantle Hospital Group and faculty member at the University of Western Australia and Curtin University. Her main research interest is focused on cortical activity, binaural hearing pathway, and brain plasticity after hearing implantation. Welcome, Ace. I would like to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Anya Kurs. Anya Kurs has Masters of Arts in Communication Science and Technical Acoustics in the University of uh, Berlin, Germany. And she also completed her MSc in Audiology in University of Southampton in 2007 and a PhD in Biomedical Engineering at the University of Bern, Switzerland in 2015. She's a technical lead at Comprehensive Hearing Health uh, so Comprehensive Hearing Center, Wurzburg, Germany, since 2015. The CHC runs a large hearing implant program that covers all implantable hearing devices and conducts up-to-date research on fitting topics, hearing performance with cochlear implants and the middle ear implants in adults and children, and intraoperative monitoring. As of 2020, Anya has 13 years of working experience in the hearing industry, and she has been uh, worked in hearing aid industry and cochlear implant industry as well. And she's an active member of the hearing group an international network of 30 prominent centers offering comprehensive hearing implant solutions for the treatment of hearing loss. Welcome, Anya. I'd like to welcome uh, Great Martins. Great Martins holds a position as a professor at the University of Antwerp and is coordinating the clinical cochlear implant research program at the ENT department of Antwerp University in Belgium. She completed her PhD on single-sided deafness and partial deafness at Antwerp University in 2015 and her master's studies in audiology at the Catholic University of uh, Leuven in 2011. Welcome, Meg. And I would like to welcome Dr. Uh, Sharanya Narayan. Dr. Sharanya Narayan is from, uh, she was, she finished uh, MD in microbiology from Madras Medical College and began her career as a microbiologist at Lister's Laboratory, currently called as Lister Metropolis in Chennai, and retired as a director from Lister Metropolis in 2004. In 1995, she co-founded co Jeevan Blood Bank and Research Center. Now it's called the Jeevan Stem Cell Foundation, a not-for-profit blood center in Chennai, which has set several milestones in transfusion medicine in India. She co-founded India's only polycard blood bank in 2007, Be the Cure Registry, of adults stem cell donors in 2015. And uh, she also started the genomics NGS uh, HLA laboratory in 2017, and the only facility to be accredited by the European Federation for Immunologists in Southeast Asia, sorry, immunogenetics in Southeast Asia. She is currently the technical director and chief microbiologist of Newburgh Ehrlich Laboratory. Dr. Sharanya is a noted speaker on blood banking, cord blood banking, medical ethics, and microbiology in conferences worldwide. She has several publications to her credit in peer-reviewed journals. 
and finally myself is uh, ranjit rajeshwaran i am the uh, principal and director of merv institute speech and hearing and uh, also the chief audiologist at madras inter research foundation in chennai i would like to start the meeting here and we all know that this is a very unfortunate situation that we are all going through and uh, this uh, pandemic has affected not just one country because its pandemic is affected all over the world irrespective of how the how superpower the country is or how the low economic status the countries are it has affected everywhere so the virus has uh, infected people without any discrimination whether it's caste creed religion or economical uh, reasons now as a consequence of that the world has become still and activities have been slowed down in all uh, 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 faculties of uh, medicine engineering trade commerce and everything but uh, what we have seen is i think we are looking at different phases of this particular uh, virus which is uh, taking place at different countries all over the world and uh, slowly we are all resuming back to work and uh, and and now at, this is a very important moment that you know we all have to come up with some kind of uh, uh, recommendations uh, to proceed and meet the challenges and uh, uh, to help the patients in during this difficult period and so the goal of the meeting is to learn from the uh, uh, experience and the expertise uh, of the uh, clinicians all over the world where they have overcome this particular problem where they have taken different steps and measures to overcome the problem at, at, at particular uh, phase of this pandemic and also we provide uh, to provide good recommendations and offer new ideas to manage the situation and to face challenges in the future so the outcome of the meeting will be documented uh, and will be uh, uh, published as a, a final recommendations to the uh, audiologist uh, in providing audiological services during this pandemic time and in the future times and also to increase the safety and confidence for both the health workers and also to the patients so keeping that in mind so we have seen different phases of this uh, uh, pandemic so from a, a very beginning phase to the a peak stage and also offset period and there are some countries which has get rid of this pandemic and we are also expecting the second wave to come this is something which is very important that we need to be very very cautious about so now what we do is we will ask the panelist who has uh, survived through different phases of this pandemic and we'll get some input from them and regarding uh, different phases and how they have overcome during this time and also please tell us about the uh, the 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 number of cases that has been resumed to you in your clinic compared to uh, uh, in comparative to different phases so with that i will start with um, anya kurs anya kurs is from germany anya can you please share your experience uh, because uh, it looks like germany has really overcome this problem and uh, uh, you are looking and and you, you people are doing very fine both in terms of the clinical activity and regular activities so you'll be happy to uh, listen from you anya please uh, go ahead Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Oh, yeah. Okay, so I'm sorry for the delay. I'm finding some uh, audio problems. So um, I'm now with you over the phone. So I would like to share some experience that we um, had now here in Germany, but of course I'm just talking for the hospital here in Bavaria. Um, as you might know, um, there are many federal states here in Germany, and so there are different regulations in every federal state. So for us, it all started um, at the 16th of March, where it was declared that there is a major shutdown. So for us uh, in Würzburg, this meant that there was a task force unit founded within the hospital that reacted very, very quickly to all the new regulations that came in daily or, you know, on a weekly basis. So for us in the hospital, that, this meant that um, all the hygienic regulations were updated, there were visitors prohibited, and um, there was a, a na nice communication um, channel to all the employees within the hospital. So on the 23rd of March, um, it, we were told to cover our mouth and nose whenever we were entering the hospital and keep two meter distance. And then from the 25th of March, there was an internal PCI testing unit for the employees only. And very shortly afterwards, we had a screening app or an app um, that told us whenever we had symptoms, how to react. Um, some might um, remember that there were daily um, changes in whatever the Robert Koch Institute had, uh, said at that time. So this app was updated on a, on a daily basis. However, we always, as employees, had a chance to receive PCR testing whenever uh, we had to go to work or uh, but felt unwell. 
And straight right from the beginning, all patients that needed to be hospitalized were PCR screened. But of course, for us as a hearing center, well, all the surgeries were canceled because there were only emergency surgeries allowed. So please switch the slide. Okay, so for us at the hearing center, that meant that from 16 March onwards, we were canceling all the scheduled appointments in the comprehensive hearing center. We had the recommendation to work from home whenever possible and you know, also to take holidays. But you can imagine that the nurses that are working here in the audiology department, they, they cannot work from home. So um, shortly afterwards, or let's say, I, I believe this were four weeks later on, we started um, to activate all the CI recipients that received the cochlear implant just before the shutdown. Um, but the rule was to see one patient per day. And uh, we do have um, many things in place like instructions for use, how to treat your sound process and so on. But at that point, we really sat down with all the speech therapists and created nice material to hand out to all patients to really reduce the time of contact we had with them. And then towards the end of April, we started to, you know, to, do with, uh, to schedule the CI and middle ear implants fittings. And we, there was a lot of time that we kept in between the appointments so to allow cleaning. I believe this was one hour. So um, by mid-May, we, we took one patient per hour. This means one fitting patient per hour because the counseling in the ENT booth was a little bit different. But now since mid-June, I would say we are nearly back to the usual booking. A lot has changed within our department because the whole procedure of how we see patients, how to keep distance has changed. May, may I ask uh, the other panelists uh, from other uh, continents as well to give a, a short uh, input about uh, how you have overcome different phases and especially what percentage of patients are visiting now compared to your previous full load of cases. I mean, I'll, I'll start with Great. Great, can you? Share some of your experience on that. Yes, so this is Hrit. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you great. Okay, so what about the current situation uh, in Belgium? I'm very happy to say that uh, next week, phase four of the phasing out will start. So we are returning step by step back to normal again, uh, or rather we are going back to the, to the new normal, let's say. Um, today, we still have uh, on average 90 new infections per day and on average five daily deaths. And in Belgium, intensive care units altogether count 40 COVID-19 patients today. So compared um, to about 1,250 during uh, the COVID peak in Belgium. So we can say that today we are at uh, the long tail of the curve. Then what about uh, ongoing national restrictions? In this phase four, for example, um, this still includes the so-called bubbles. In we are allowed to meet with 15 different people in total, in addition to our own family. Um, so in Belgium, at this moment, like I said, we are returning back to uh, the new normal in very small steps. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Meg, can we get some input from you? Uh, so um, in the US, we went into a shutdown in March and then um, it was about um, at, at that time, our clinical audiology team, they were only allowed to see critical cases. And so patients that were suspected of having a device failure. Um, so I believe we had one clinical audiologist in the um, in the clinic seeing those patients and then the rest of them were redeployed to other departments in our hospital to support the COVID patients and increase in demand um, in those departments. And with in May, we started to see the ramp up of clinical procedures. And so a lot of our clinical audiologists were brought back um, to the clinic at initially at 50% capacity and now um, as of June, they are back to 100% capacity and have seen the backlog of patients that were unable to be seen because they were not labeled as critical during that time. So that's encouraging that we're able to get folks back in 
um, and be seen for those visits that we know are important for cochlear implant patients. For research, um, we were pulled from the clinic um, in March as well, and then we're allowed to come back in um, on case by case approvals. And so um, right now we are at 50% capacity because we have to get each clinical researcher approved to come back into the clinic um, and are working through seeing those patients and getting that all back up and running. So um, as you've seen in the US, we're starting to see in, and also in North Carolina an increase in cases again. And that is because we recently went um, from a full lockdown into being able to, you know, resume groups of 10 or less to um, go to um, restaurants and things like that. And so we're seeing an increase in cases again, and we are all cautiously optimistic about what could happen with that. Thank you, great. It's nice. So, Days, can we take some input from Australia? Sure. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. You're clear. Um, question of Australia actually was, um, has been managed pretty well, I would say. So, uh, we have in the whole country, we have five, uh, seven and a half thousand affected people. In Western Australia, we, we, we are we, we used to say that we are an island inside an island because Perth is the most isolated city in the world. So we definitely made the most of it. So we have a very limited number of cases. We have uh, 608 as of today um, patients uh, that was infected with a very small number of active cases. We, However, the difference, uh, there is no difference in terms of management. Uh, we did the same. Lockdown uh, at the beginning of March, we were told that we had to stop of our, our clinics. So, the, in terms of the implant, we actually did not stop the work totally. The surgeries were stopped for sure, but the implant, the audiology clinic actually kept running. We had one week where we did not have patients coming in, but we put in place um, something to to ensure that the patients will actually continue to look out to look after. For, for instance, I, uh, one thing that we did was uh, the hostel transition within a week, the hostel transition from a face to face appointment to a telehealth. So the patients were all the patients who were booked within the next 5 weeks were informed that they would receive a video call uh, with the instructions. So as long as they had uh, internet and a telephone or a computer, anything. Uh, actually, we kept the face to face uh, the video call appointments with them for follow up. For the surgeries that had happened, we went ahead with the switch on um, with all the, 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 the PPE and all the cares that we needed. Uh, the things that we definitely stopped was the vestibular clinics. We, we had uh, to stop, of course. But at the implant, we, we had few situations where, where we had to reprogram the implant for whatever reason, the implant was not working. Only in critical cases that we, we actually sent a computer to the patient's house and we uh, set up a system where we remotely could program the patient uh, from home. Um, yeah, so now we are back to normal, even the vestibular clinic, we have been back to normal normal, the new normal, as Greg said, uh, uh, for the last five weeks already. So we are at full uh, capacity and surgeries, um, the elective surgeries have commenced again uh, as well four weeks ago. Thank you. Thank you, um, um, Jais. And uh, back in India, I think uh, we are still in, haven't reached the peak. India is going through a worse uh, scenario at the moment and we start in mean, the lockdown uh, began almost the three, third week of March, and uh, we are still undergoing lockdown. But we have a staggered lockdown; it's not a continuous lockdown. And uh, as of now, there are close to 492,000 cases, which is uh, uh, diagnosed with COVID positive in India, and out of which uh, 15,000 uh, of them have, uh, have died due to uh, COVID-19. Uh, uh, and uh, but uh, interestingly, 286,000 uh, uh, patients are recovered very well out of this COVID. So this is the status in India. And uh, uh, from March, uh, the third week onwards, we closed our uh, uh, clinic for one week completely. And then we started slowly resuming our audiological work, attend to 
some of the emergency cases like uh, um, a sudden hearing loss and meningitis and then with a very limited faculty doing a basic audiometry test and then from the mid of april we started uh, uh, doing all the audiological investigations except the vestibular investigations and uh, transtympanic or, or any invasive procedures and by the uh, first week of uh, may we've started doing the ci surgeries as well but uh, we're doing all the procedures now but very limited faculty and with very limited uh, appointments so if you look at the number of patients those are coming to us with compared to the previous uh, regular case load we only have 25 percent to 30 percent of the patients are reporting to the clinic so and uh, this is very similar uh, situation to our neighboring countries as well like bangladesh and nepal and sri lanka as well and uh, uh, and I, I clearly understand that you know there are different phases that we are getting into but the only thing is india has not yet reached the the, the, the peak of this uh, uh, pandemic uh, which we're expecting sometime in the mid july or so so uh, thank you so much for this inputs and now uh, we we did a survey uh, 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 we sent out a survey to understand what is a, uh, the impact uh, on, of the pandemic on the audiology practice and uh, we collected uh, a lot of inputs uh, from the uh, respondents and we in fact we collected 71 responses from 11 countries as well and what we understood from the survey is i think uh, it, the, the services have been impacted uh, in general in most of the uh, uh, countries and now almost 70% uh, uh, of the services have been recovering. Slowly, they started uh, uh, resuming the services and they, they're not working completely. Some of the services are deferred by the audiologists and some of the services are deferred by the management of the infection control board. And in some countries uh, or in some clinics, I would say, all services are even stopped even at this point of time. So, uh, I mean, uh, understanding this particular situation and also uh, giving uh, looking at the... Um, the challenges uh, what the patients have been facing uh, when they resume to the clinic one of the biggest challenge seems to be uh, there was a hesitant to come to the clinic because of the possible risk of infection and uh, and it, it it varies among uh, among the uh, centers so i i absolutely take this uh, uh, opportunity to to ask the panelists now uh, for and especially i would like to focus this question to days and also to anya where the services have been completely recovered so in your opinion and uh, what do you think uh, is the one of the biggest challenge for the patient uh, coming back to the clinic uh, at different phases mm -hmm. so i'll start with uh, anya anya can you give some input on this well um, about the biggest challenges for our patients i have to admit that during the shutdown, um, first of all, we were calling all patients and um, told them that they shouldn't come for their appointments. And even today, we have the situations that some patients don't want to come to the clinic because they're still afraid. So um, from the clinical directive, we had uh, newspaper articles uh, saying, um, telling the population that it's safe to come to the hospital. We have many regulations and we are screening and it's safe to come. So we had the situations that uh, people didn't want to come to the hospital for their necessary treatment. So I think right now um, I have to say uh, we kind of feel, we, we feel safe, but maybe that's a false um, false impression. Uh, I mean, we see the new numbers of we see the volume of testing every day, and we see how many new people are infected, and especially here in the north of Bavaria, this uh, this number is very low. But this is completely different in in other um, federal states here in Germany as new infections pop up. So um, I think this is one of the um, problems to um, to actually, you know, tell patients that they need their treatment and they should come back. Okay, thanks, thanks. I'm uh, really, really interested to know that, you know, patients are still scared of coming and that's a very important message that you conveyed that, you know, the, there was a, a advertisement in the paper by uh, when asking the patients to come for the uh, resume to uh, normal life. That's an interesting point that to note. And Dace, do you have any comments on this? Yeah, uh, Mandesh, we, we, uh, I would agree that uh, probably the, one of the biggest challenges is actually the patient to trust that everything is okay. So at the very beginning, for example, as I said, we continue to see our patients you know, that was not face-to-face. Uh, uh, -face. Most of the things that could be done um, uh, through telehealth, that it was the way that we, we did. Um, uh, gradually, the patients that were urgent, like 
like uh, and, and, and everybody else uh, take into account to meningitis, uh, head trauma, anything that could um, difficult they, they recover. These patients were seen and there was no um, discussion. But when we started uh, bringing the patients back to clinic, which it took probably around four weeks uh, at the beginning of April, uh, there was a big number of DNA not necessarily DNA, but patient counseling the appointment and say, I don't feel that uh, I'm safe. And what's very interesting because one thing that we looked at the population was the elderly population and people with uh, any health complications. So people were very aware of um, being away from the hostel. Uh, but we, we, what we did once we started ramping up the clinics, we were sending um, uh, uh, SMS. 12 patients 48 hours before saying that the appointment was confirmed and everything was in place, listing a little bit of things that were in place to ensure that they were safe. And this was enough for people to trust. And of course, the hostel put a lot of things in place. I imagine that everywhere else in the world to do the same in terms of the distancing, uh, decreasing the time that they were in the in the room. We did send a letter to them uh, in advance as well, saying that the appointment would be very short in time to make sure they they were in hospital and with the clinician for a short period of time. Uh, we, as I said, we have been back to normal, the new normal for the last now five weeks, and yeah, I would say that we are at the stage where we don't have DNAs, we don't have cancellation because of the worry with uh, the virus uh, anymore. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Dace. That's interesting. So what I see is I think we need to keep ourselves safe and give confidence to the patients and we need to tell them that, you know, uh, I mean, give them a uh, heads up about the I mean, the precautions that has been taken uh, care in the facilities for them to come confidently. Thank you very much for that information. And um, I would move on to the next question. And now we know that we're going to start all the audiological procedures. And what do you think is the, uh, 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 what indication do you think is very important for immediate audiological uh, procedure? So uh, there are different indications where audiological investigation is, is mandated. So among these different indications, what do you think is the most important indication as an emergency uh, procedure where the audiologist's role plays a major role in this particular uh, 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 disorder or a case? So I'll start with Great. Great, can you just uh, give some inputs on that, please? Okay, so um, which indications that we here at the Antwerp University Hospital considered as urgent? Uh, I think here we completely agree with the conclusions uh, from the panelists from the previous hearing live webinar. That, uh, cochlear implantation is not an elective surgery, uh, but it's only in some cases an emergency surgery. So, for example, um, in the case of neurolinguistic emergencies, when children are suffering from bilateral severe profound hearing loss uh, and in the time frame of high brain plasticity. So um, in these cases, the surgery shall not be delayed, I think, for more than one month. Uh, and then also, I think uh, that we can all agree that meningitis cases are urgent as well. Uh, I'm also very curious to see the results from the survey from the audience about uh, the list of the urgencies in the audiological services. So uh, thanks, great. And this is the uh, the response of the uh, audience for the survey. So this is the um, um, the services within the audiology. So they have uh, rated the percentage of uh, uh, so, I mean, uh, procedures that is important based on the hierarchy. Now we have classified into two groups: one is the urgent and the less important, and the most important group. And if you look at this survey. You would see uh, most of them have rated the newborn screening and the CA troubleshooting and hearing aid fitting is very, very important. And uh, the vestibular testing and the ABR for adults is uh, least important. So this is the report from the uh, survey what you've what you've got. And and also a uh, very uh, uh, limited number of uh, 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 people uh, have preferred that uh, CA switch on and fitting is important, but was measured with the people have uh, again uh, uh, said the CA switch on and fitting was not so important for them at this point of time. So uh, can we get some uh, highlight on this uh, based on the experiences from the Woosburg Clinic? You know, now how did they prioritize the audiological testing and under 
different situations or different phases, how did they increase the priority or how did they widen the priority in this particular aspect? So I'll, I'll, I'll ask the Uzba clinic to talk about it. Maybe Anya, can you some, uh, share some uh, of your information? How did you prioritize the audiological procedures in your clinic? Um, well, as mentioned before, um, at the beginning, there was a rejection of service. And then we sat together in a group and thought, okay, what is important to follow up on? And um, so for us, important was the initial activation and the one month appointment. So for our CI patients and also the middle ear patients, uh, we have a routine during the first year. So after the um, initial activation that usually takes place four weeks after surgery, we see uh, patients at the one month, three months, six months interval, and then we um, shift over to yearly appointments. And so for us, it was important to see the, those patients that received their initial activation because we think the one month appointment, the three month appointments are very, very important. So we made a list of priority, priorities for adults and also a list for children. And uh, according to that list, we started to call the patients and ask them to come in again. Uh, of course, there were emergency bearers and EKGs uh, possible, but I don't recall that there were too many at that time. Um, another factor was that um, the audiometric testing, so usually we have a huge testing battery, but during that time, I mean, there were not too many people in the house, there was a limited amount of patients. So of course, the audiometric testing was reduced too. And as um, I believe the, the surgeons have talked about that uh, too, ENT uh, consultations is a very, very risky area because people are opening their mouths and so during that time, um, our doctors were only allowed to check the ear, and we were talking about every patient, is it now, is it now important that this CI patient or this uh, middle uh, ear recipient is going to see the doctor, yes or no? And also from that time on, there were no accompanying persons um, allowed um, in our center or in the whole building. So for our center itself, um, we had no more waiting areas, and uh, we installed the bell at the entrance of um, our center, and there was a big um, plate saying, uh, please take a seat and wait until somebody's coming to pick you up. So we made sure that patients are not seeing other patients, so they, we really try to reduce the opportunity to interact with other people, and we also reduced the time that the clinicians uh, spend with the patients. And when you all know that, patients are usually not on time or sometimes are not on time. And during that period, we, we, we asked patients to leave the building and wait outside. So um, during the course of the time, um, a lot happened. And now, as you can see on that picture, we installed many, many new waiting areas, only, always two seats, one seat for the patient and the other one for the potentially accompanying person. And if you just, uh, if you go to the next slide, please. Okay. Oh, uh, okay. Sorry, there, we go there, is this. Another, <laughs> there is another picture, and uh, maybe I'd address that uh, later on um, concerning the waiting areas. Since we made a many new waiting areas, um, we, had, uh, we had to demonstrate the way where they should be, but we talk about it later on. Yeah, we, that's coming up in the next few slides. Uh, yeah. And yeah, now I would like to ask the question to uh, Meg. Meg, I think uh, we all know that you know delaying the CA surgery or uh, uh, delaying the uh, rehabilitation or the switch on causes a lot of uh, uh, delay with respect to the language development, and it really impacts the language and speech and cognitive development. So my question to you is, you know, in your opinion, and what do you think is the optimal uh, delay that can be uh, considered? Uh, between the surgery to switch on or from the uh, diagnosis to the surgery. So what do you think is the optimal time uh, that that we can is acceptable? Yeah, um, you know, I, I think between diagnosis and surgery, you know, to repeat what's been said by the other panelists, it really depends on um, the type of hearing loss. And so if it's meningitis, that's obviously critical and needs to happen um, as soon as possible. But um, for patients that have, you know, a progressive hearing loss um, that's in that moderate to profound range or classic cochlear implant um, candidate, then I think then we're thinking it's appropriate to wait 
three months, at least when we were in the, um, the shutdown period. Um, and when we were really trying to determine who is a critical patient and who is a patient that could wait a couple of months. Um, as far as waiting after surgery for activation, um, you know, we've prioritized that. We really don't want to go beyond um, four weeks. And that has been a service that we've considered to be critical after somebody has undergone the surgery to come in and have the activation. Something that we've been paying more attention to is the importance of coming back for that one month appointment. And so I think it was Anya talking about the one month appointment being an important and a priority. Um, and that was something originally we thought, well, if you provide them with progressive maps, then maybe that's enough to get them to a two month or a three month interval. Um, and after seeing a few folks that have missed that one month interval, we're finding that's not really appropriate that um, there's a lot of acclimatization that's happening within that first month that you know we expect to happen, but delaying it another month, you may you know, not support the patient to have that improvement in speech perception that you would expect at that two month interval. Um, so now we have made that also a critical appointment. So the activation and the one month follow up as well as the three month follow up to make sure that we're providing them with an appropriate map so they're continuing to improve in their speech recognition. And I've got one more question uh, to add on to it. And considering a patient with a bilateral sequential implant, do you think that's an emergency? Or that's one case. In other cases, a patient who had a, a, a unilateral implant and uh, he had a, a, a infection or due to some device failures where he has to do the revision surgery. So do you also consider these two situations as an emergency procedures that need to be done immediately? So the second one, absolutely. So cases of um, failure or infection, those are things that um, are, are labeled critical and were labeled as critical um, when we were in the shutdown to see the physician and then also proceed with the implant. Um, and we know that um, there was a company that was also going through um, a soft failure. And so we were paying attention to recipients of that particular device to make sure that they were not presenting with any of those signs. And if they were, then bringing them in to make sure um, that they were seen at an appropriate time to, to warrant and to move forward with a revision surgery. Um, as far as someone who has um, a sequent or is being a candidate for a sequential cochlear implant, um, those were postponed and we are now starting to reschedule those. Um, and that's where we've seen that patients are wanting to come back in um, and be seen for that second side visit. So those were not labeled as critical and they're still not labeled as critical. Um, but now that we have reached the second phase where we are back in the clinical ramp up, um, the patients are coming in and being evaluated. Thank you. Thank you very much, Meg. So the next is uh, we would like to ask uh, um, Dace and uh, also uh, uh, Great. Can you just please comment about what are the services that requires the patient's visit and what are the services that you can give online or offline? Uh, because uh, you both have been working in a full fledged now and especially uh, uh, days is uh, doing a lot of uh, tele practices now. Can you just highlight us uh, 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 some information on that uh, days? Yes, we we do a lot of uh, la, uh, telehealth, um, as you said, when it's and uh, for us then was we were one step ahead maybe with uh, the lockdown because we did for us was uh we followed the same thing that meg is saying um the the switch on and the first follow-ups within the three month post post-op for us was a priority so this was face to face so we have to remember that you don't have a hundred patients, uh, at least we don't, a hundred patients do for switch on in a week. So it can be really spread out. We put one patient a day to make sure that everything could be done properly. And all the all the all the follow-ups that were above three months, they were done uh, using telehealth. So for us, I, I still think that a cochlear implant switch on is the priority. Um, and of course, if you are, in the middle of the peak, maybe it's not, but if you can continue with the switch on, I think the switch on in the first three months is definitely important. Everything else, they even the I think that even the pre CI counseling is absolutely important, but it can be done um, using telehealth. 
In terms of the troubleshooting, what we put in place was um, if the person had something broken, we tried uh, using uh, telehealth just to find out what was wrong. So the patient would just drop, with, so we knew already what was uh, wrong with the device, they would drop it off in a, um, uh, in a container at the front desk, would go away to an open area, we would fix it and give them a call when it was ready to collect, just to make sure that the, there was no people, were no people waiting in the, in the waiting area. But yeah, um, I think that, I hope that I have answered your question, Ranjit. Yes. Great, do you want to add on something to this? I think we completely agree with all the hearing colleagues that the activation of the cochlear implant can be seen as an urgent um, appointment. Also, the troubleshooting and the other appointments, we are in line with uh, the other centers, I think. So, nothing to add. Uh, how about the newborn screening? So, how do we go ahead with the newborn screening? Have you adopted any new uh, technique to do the newborn screening during this time? Or uh, um, maybe, Meg, you're, you're working in a university-based hospital and also uh, the, the clinic. So, can you tell us something about the newborn screening? How do you do it in your place now? When a baby is born, we have a nurse come in and they do the newborn hearing screening um, with the in the room with the mother and the child. Um, so that is still happening. And then those that fail the, that screening um, are seen by an audiologist prior to leaving the hospital. Um, so that was also labeled as critical and we maintained an audiologist within the hospital to see those patients. But the ABR, the follow-up ABR, um, that was a little challenging because that's something that's seen in the clinic. And so making sure that families felt safe to come in um, if they had failed both those initial screenings was a, a little bit of a challenge. But I think, you know, prioritizing your child's hearing help is something that is communicated well with the family and um, those children are coming in and being seen. And well, well, that's uh, that's good. So here in Murph, what we do is we do a, a video consultation for pre-CI counseling, and also we do the uh, uh, online consultation for looking at the basic troubleshooting of the uh, of the accessories. So this has been what been uh, uh, doing in our clinic. And uh, uh, next, I would like to go to the optimization of the patient flow. This is something very important. So we know that you know there are a lot of patients coming back slowly, resuming back to the work. And a lot of clinicians have started working. But what is more challenging is we all know that the social distancing, the reduced contact with the clinician, reduced contact with the patient among themselves, and reduced contact with the facilities in the in the hospital or the institute, and also the hygiene plays a major role in reducing the spread of this uh, uh, virus. So keeping those things in mind, so we need to optimize the patient flow. So with respect to how right from the point of entry to the point of exit. At where they pass through different departments or different tests has to be very well coordinated, synchronized, equal distancing has to be maintained. So there needs to be a different plan and the modification which need to be adopted, which never existed before because it was not priority for us. And also looking at the different measures that has been in place in the, in the, in the, in the existing facilities in the institute or the hospitals, right from the uh, 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 testing for the COVID and also for basic sanitization procedures. And from the survey, what we find is 50% of the clinics does not have uh, facilities to do the COVID screening at the entrance. So this is what we found from the survey. So may I ask uh, um, uh, Anya Kurz from the Wurzburg Clinics, you know, uh, what modifications that they have made to manage the patient flow uh, in a stream? Anya, can you please, uh, some ideas. Okay, so um, this is just to give you some impressions um, what has changed here. So here on the left side you see the entrance area as it looked before and is even now um, back to normal again. But what has changed a lot is you can see all the adhesive tapes on the floor. So uh, this is this is new. So usually it's not that colorful here in our department. It's to show the direction. So as mentioned before, we were installing new waiting areas, and we it was quite difficult for us to tell the patient, "Well, go and sit down, and then we call you for the next appointment to see the doctor." And the big question was where to place all those pa those patients and to find them 
as soon as the doctor had time to, to see them again. So this has really changed that uh, it's now quite colorful here. And um, we're telling patients to disinfect their hands. I mean, people have, they are um, security based at the entrance of every um, clinic here. And uh, security is telling you to, um, well, take a mask. So you are receiving a medical mask whenever you are entering the clinic building. You have to disinfect your hands. And the same is happening when you are entering again our department, as you can see here. So we are telling people, please disinfect your hands. Um, at that point, they are wearing a mask already. And then they have to answer a whole list of questions, um, assessing if they had contact with somebody. Yes, that's the right picture. Um, so you can see here, it's not a close-up, but these are all the questions that are asked. It's now all fully digital. So the lady at the counter is asking, where have you been? Did you have contact to anybody? Do you feel healthy? So on. Um, for us as staff, so we are checking the temperature every day, and um, we don't do this with our patients. So by asking them the whole questions, um, this is now set with the patient record and also for the accompanying um, person if there is one. What you also can see here, it's not too clear, is that we have now um, glass partitions everywhere, nearly everywhere. So we, we have them here at um, the registration desk. We have them in the fitting rooms and the counseling rooms. So this has changed a lot. And also on the floor again, there are many signs telling, yes, this is a waiting area, one of the few. And it's funny, whenever you have found a place where you can sit down, you see here on the left side, there are many things that you can now read. So it's declaring, okay, this is waiting area two. And the next, she, uh, the next uh, paper says, well, keep within the line. And the other one says, please keep distance and so on. Um, so this has changed quite a bit. It's now very colorful here. Many directions to read in our department. So thank you, uh, Anya. This, can you give some information from what modifications has been adopted in your center? Um, this slide provides an overview of some of uh, the minimal steps in the procedures that are set by the board of our clinic, so in the Antwerp University Hospital. Um, so that means that uh, these procedures and emergency management plan applies all departments, so not only our ENT department. Um, all our staff members receive the updates about the current patient flow, so from the pre-triage to the registration at your department. Uh, there's always an online check-in for the in and for the out patient care. So uh, the patients only with a completed survey screening and with body temperature screening, they are allowed to enter the clinic. And um, you're also only allowed to enter the clinic through one entrance, so the main entrance of the clinic to ensure this kind of uh, screening. And also still, of course, meetings uh, should be limited to 10 colleagues here in Antwerp. Meetings with externals should be avoided. And of course, the general social distance rule of 1.5 meter compared to the two meters in uh, Germany, I heard, uh, also applies in the clinic. So that's about it for the general hospital-wide patient flow here in Antwerp. So, and what I observe from the uh... For both of you is number one is you're using the electronic uh, interview format and where you don't see the patient face to face in case if you have to see a patient face to face there is a a, a glass uh, a, a partition between the registration uh, desk and the patient as well and you have I mean, even even doubt the uh, uh, chairs and the sitting areas with a lot of signages and for the patients to um, i mean uh, make the ease of flow Thank you so much, great. Thank you so much. So now we'll go for the distance factor, which is very important because distance, social distancing is one of the most important thing to, to prevent ourselves from getting infected. So uh, in this regard, I would like to ask uh, uh, Dr. Sharanya Narayan. And uh, uh, Dr. Sharanya, what is the ideal distancing between two people? And what is the level of risk with respect to the distancing? Uh, Dr. Sharanya, can you please share your uh, uh, thoughts yeah. on this? Yeah. I think I think this is just the same that uh, some of the speakers earlier had mentioned. That is a distance of about two meters or six feet, as we usually say in this part of the world. Uh, and uh, there have been studies actually to show that even when it's one meter distance, that is just three feet distance between people, uh, the risk of uh, picking up an infection is kind of uh, 
13% of people can pick up an infection if they are closer, if they are less than one meter apart. Whereas if it's two meters and more, each, uh, each, each meter more means the risk reduces by 3%. So that just goes to show you that even two meters is not, uh, uh, what shall I say, uh, one size fits all because it doesn't depend upon the distance alone. It also depends upon the viral load of the patient and of course the uh, receiver's immune status. But a rough figure is two meters is what we say. And uh, you feel definitely safer if you have the masks in position. And uh, I think that's about it. So I think that's the safest one can get. And especially in a country like here, where we have massive overcrowding, I think even that two meters is very difficult to meet. In fact, that's one of the biggest challenges we face at our testing laboratory. Because every morning we place the chairs a neat distance away from each other so that patients are well separated from each other. But within five minutes, you find them pulling their chairs together and having a very companionable chat. So we are constantly monitoring and making sure they separate uh, you know, their chairs and sit apart, but two meters, it would be ideal. Okay. Doctor, so when you mean two meters, the two meters of radius, right? It's just not right. I mean, uh, two meters, when somebody's in front of you, the two, two meters are 360 degrees. So that's what you Yeah, mean. exactly, exactly. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Sharnia. So I've got the next question to you as well. So, I mean, um, what modifications uh, that you would incorporate in your facility? Because we heard what modifications that they have in the uh, clinics in uh, Germany, uh, Belgium, and uh, Australia. But uh, given to the Indian conditions, like emerging countries, you might have uh, you, you are sitting in one of the most busiest lab where they uh, test most of the COVID patients have been diagnosed from your laboratory in in, in Chennai. So, what do you think in a clinic, a, a small clinic, a small audiology clinic, which is not associated with a hospital or a university. So what modifications do you think is essential? I think like uh, what we introduced has been a good thing, which is something that I'm sure you all have already introduced. That is just at the entrance. We have a security guard who actually asks the patient why they have come for the test. And if and uh, we do a temperature check, straight away insist that sanitizer there. And uh, uh, then afterwards, we uh, allow them to go in for the testing. So this is something that is automatically done. And we have, uh, you know, uh, like we have standby staff for every, so like now if you have a front office person who's dealing with the patients this week, next week they're off and we have another lot of people dealing with the patients. So that they're not in continuous contact with the patient. That is something we've done and also uh, even uh, since most of our, uh, our seating area is quite large. So here again, we've kind of barricaded the chairs in between so that they cannot sit down in the chairs in between while they are waiting to be called for their tests. So I think this is something that can easily be done in any facility. And uh, even, uh, even if a time comes when we have queues of people walking in, uh, we have our uh, you know, places marked for them to actually stand just like you have in all the immigration counters across the world. And the other thing that we've done is our collection staff and all of that are in full PPE because we don't know who we are dealing with. So they are in full PPE and there are, there are bottles of sanitizer kept all around the place. And after every person comes in, we do wipe down the tables, the chairs, so that it is at least to that extent disinfected after that patient has exited. So I think this is something that can be incorporated as a routine and like, like the new normal would have to be this. Just to uh, uh, highlight on this, you know, because we all know that some of the patients are quite scary to come, you know, even for testing themselves uh, to, to, uh, for this COVID posture or even if they want to come for audiological testing, the biggest yeah. scare from the survey, yeah. what we have seen is, you know, I mean, they're hesitant to come because they're so scared that they may get infected. So the question is, you know, uh, what measures that we need to do to ensure safety for them? So you know, previously, uh, uh, Anya said and uh, Day said they've sent out uh, 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 appointments. They they make prayer phone calls. Yeah, they I even think, advertise in the paper. Yeah, so what have you done? No, what we have done is, uh, see, what we have done is a little different from your setting. But what we did is we yeah, have two sets of staff staff who go for the home collection for collecting samples from non-COVID patients and from COVID patients are a different set. So the people who go to the houses where there are very COVID infected patients are completely different. 
from those who go for non covid infected patients like for instance a, a person an elderly person wanting to have their usual lipid profile or a uh, urine culture done we do not send anybody who is in contact with a potential covid patient and then like in your setting i think the uh, like you have already spoken i think you about what you will consider very urgent so i think a lot of your consultations have to be daily consultations and only taken those that have to come in but even for those that have to come in i think you all will have to segregate based on whether they have any clinical symptoms or not i think you all will need to check out if they have anything uh, remotely like covid and nowadays unfortunately i think everything is being labeled very covid so it is going to be difficult but if anybody is a little sick with any symptoms that could be potentially covid i think you will need to have a separate area to uh, handle them Uh, another another question to you. So we when, quite often during this COVID, one big terminology that we have been hearing, especially the the clinicians, is the PPEs, the personal protection equipments. And you know, uh, when I studied in the university, I was completely unaware of what PPE is. You know, it was not. I mean, in the part of the curriculum, even the hygiene protocols are not in the part of the audiological curriculum. Now, now we have to adopt this in the future. so can you just highlight us what level of pp is required for audiologist and what level of pp is required for the patient and are there any specific pp for children because we see a, a big chunk of uh, pediatric load in a, in a, in all our clinics so can you just highlight on what what, what these pp is are and what level has to be used see i think if you are going to be dealing with spills uh, or any procedure that involves a lot of uh, spillage then i think you would need to go for the highest level of pp with your visors and your n95 masks with respirators like you would do at the time of any surgery but if there are no spills you can stick with an n95 mask but you don't need the visor and you can continue with your uh, mask your your gloves and your uh, gown you don't need the bubble suit like they would need if there is a spillage which is completely like a complete suit um now for the patients all the patients who come in are straight away offered a uh, triple layer surgical mask uh that is the first step uh when they come in so i think that is something that can be put in and for the third thing that you mentioned about ppe for children uh after i saw this question i actually checked up with our suppliers they don't have any specific ppes for children as of now when i say children i mean for newborns or for very small children but uh the children who are you know walking running for all of them unfortunately they wear on uh the regular gown which covers them up completely uh, and of course they are trained to wear on you need to explain to them the need to wear on a mask which is very difficult because children want to take it off so we need to explain to them why they need to have this mask on but that's easier said than done though i must say some children who are very sick are very compliant and they do wear on the mask but uh, i don't think there are any specific tp is meant for children thanks doctor thanks for that information so which means like you know whenever there is a spill that we need to have with a, a complete suit to protect us what our procedure we do what our procedure we do i think and especially in audiology we don't do uh, any such procedures except in the or when we go for the intraoperative uh, measures and yeah. maybe in the speech when we we need when we deal with patients with speech language disorders especially when we see patients with uh, a tracheostomy or patients with uh, stroke who has difficulty in swallowing who is using a rails tube i think that's when i think most yes, of our clinicians yes. has to wear the complete suit thank you so yes. much for that information so now uh, and we know that in a mask is one of the basic uh, uh, requirement as of now but what happens is most of us work with children with a uh, uh, hearing impairment adults with hearing impairment where they completely depend upon lip reading the communication becomes the biggest barrier when we wear the mask so now we would like to address this particular issue because this is very very important which is very relevant to the audiological practice yeah so maybe we'll ask uh, great can you just share some of your uh, uh, ideas and modifications that you have uh, done in your clinic during the last uh, two months of your practice now great can you take yes for sure um maybe we can go already to the next slide i think that we all agree that masks have a huge effect on lip reading Uh, also, the social distance rules uh, affects the performance of our hearing aid patients and our CI patients, and therefore, it's uh, our ENT department we did some adjustments, like uh, the use of face shields and plastic walls in between, so that we uh, are able to do our consultations with our CI patients without the mat masks. 
Uh, however, still hearing impaired patients, they do not only visit our department, so not only the ENT department, but also the other departments as well. And um, therefore, I think that it's it's really our duty as audiologists to encourage also other departments uh, as well to apply the optimal communication situations for our hearing impaired patients. In our clinic, for example, um, hearing impaired patients can now ask for a hearing kit when they are hospitalized. So this kit, for example, includes assistive hearing aid devices. Um, we also inform other departments and patients about possible communication strategies in times of masks uh, by making use of different flyers or a button and a badge. And I think this is uh, very, very important because the masks will become the new normal, like I said before, and they will become even more prominent in the streets scene, I think. And I don't know whether there's a next slide as well. This is Anya's uh, information. Okay. Yes. Great, just one question. So what I understand is that the hospital some kit clients who are admitted there, right? Who has a difficulty in communication. Yes. Okay, so um, fantastic. That's nice. Um, and may, may I take some inputs from Anya? Anya, can you please tell us about uh, your inputs on that? Um, well, the situation has changed over the weeks. So on that slide, that's a general summary, I would say, about all the things that we have talked uh, before. But um, talking about, you know, um, our um, our patients, hearing impaired patients, I mean, as Greed said, um, they mostly rely on lip reading, and this has created a big um, a big problem here during the the first time when we started with our services again, because people could not um, read our lips and. Right from the beginning, to be honest, we did not have uh, the glass um, partitions everywhere. So they were delivered um, one after the one. And now we are really in a good situation to have um, the glass partitions everywhere. And our staff is wearing um, masks and face shields. But however, since uh, end of May, we have um, an ordinance on infection protective measures here in Bavaria. And it's, uh, it says in here, that uh, the removal of the mouse nose cover is uh, permitted for people with hearing impairment. So this means that um, we we can take off our mask if we want to, if we feel safe um, in the counseling situation. If we are working in a room and most of the time our windows are really open, we have the glass partition, we have a lot of distance in between, and then, yes, we can take off our mask and do the fitting and people can rely on our, our lips. So that's the situation today. It was not during the lockdown, of course, but uh, this has um, the law was uh, implemented at the end of May, and at the beginning we were quite surprised. But then more more, more patients came in and said, "Well, there is this law. I cannot uh, see your mouse, so please take off uh, your mask." And so the dilemma is: is it the protection of employees, or is it um, the protection of other people too? So this is something new that came in now here. But I would say right now we are in a good situation. I mean, there are many precautions um, that have been taken and there is a lot of distance and fortunately we have now summer approaching, so it's good to have the windows open all the time. Yes, Anya, I, I completely agree with you. And in fact, even last week, the John Hopkins clinics uh, uh, published a small uh, article on what measures has to be taken when communicating with patients with hearing impairment uh, using PPEs, where they highlight on three important things. One is on the technology based uh, and uh, based on the, the sign language based, etc. So, and that's a very interesting thing to share. Uh, maybe we don't have time uh, to share that particular document with you, but maybe before the end of this meeting, I'll let us try to highlight some of the few points from there. Now, uh, next, I would like to go on to the uh, modifications that is required for audiological procedures, because considering these most important factors of social distancing, hygiene, less contact, the minimum duration, and all those things, how do we modify the procedures so that, you know, we, we, we believe... We, uh, we spend very limited number of time in the audiology booth and we really improve the hygiene as well. How do you streamline your procedures? What modifications that you know we need to make in, in performing uh, 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 the audiological uh, test? So I would like to start with Meg Dillon. Meg, can you tell us you know, how has Puritan audiometry testing changed in COVID times in your clinic and what modifications that you have done to overcome this particular uh, pandemic, especially 
uh, uh, restricting the spread of uh, this virus to the clinician and the patient. So, um, you know, we are a, a teaching hospital. So, one of the first um, practices that had to stop was to limit how many people were actually coming in contact with the patient. So, we um, had to pull students from the clinic and pull residents from the clinic, um, which you know, changes the educational opportunities, but then you're only having the clinician and the patient um, and someone else had mentioned 1 of the other panelists about um, limiting the accompanying um, parties that come with patients. And so they're not even allowed in the building unless the child is under the age of 18 um, or um, the patient is um, at an advanced age and needs a support person. Um, so, we've really limited how many people are even coming into the clinic and coming into the sound booth. Um, and then once they are in the sound booth, it's really the basic practices of, you know, if it's somebody that we've seen consecutively, if the air conduction thresholds haven't changed, then we are not repeating bone conduction thresholds just to figure out um, how, what is absolutely necessary to reduce the amount of time that the patient is in, um, in the sound booth. Um, a lot of things that have changed just from the way that we do things here, um, you know, we usually would bring the patient in to the sound booth and do some counseling about what the test procedures would be. And now it's seat the patient, um, you know, set the headphones or the insert phones and then go over to the control side of the booth and communicate via um, the headphones and then have them lip read through the screen um, to communicate what would be occurring during the testing. Um, and really trying to limit it to 10 to 15 minutes maximum. Um, and then when the diagnostic testing is complete, there is signage outside of every sound booth to indicate whether or not the sound booth has been cleaned yet. So at, if you are accompanying that person um, to another room for counseling that a fellow clinician knows that that sound booth has not been disinfected yet. Um, we've also staggered appointments so that there aren't as many patients in the hallways at the same time, because all of our sound booths, I'm sure like many clinics are all on the same hallway. And so appointment times are staggered so that there's only one patient and one clinician walking through the hallway at a certain time. Uh, just uh, one more thing. For example, if you have to do a conditioning for a, a child, uh, audiometric conditioning. So how do you do it? Do you, do you do the conditioning in the sound treated booth or you take them to another a room and do the sound treating. I'm sorry, uh, do the conditioning and, and you bring them back, or do you have two clinicians doing two different activities just to reduce the contact with the patients? So, how do you manage, especially when you're dealing with the pediatric group? Yeah, so right now that's all still occurring in the sound booth, and it depends on the age of the child um, whether or not we ask the parent to help with conditioning because there are some children, you know, who've been coming for a while and the parent is well versed in what the procedures are and can be helpful. Um, but if not, then we do have a clinician in the sound booth with the child conditioning. Um, if the child is over the age of two, then they are wearing a mask and the clinicians are wearing um, procedure mask and then a face shield in, in those instances as well. May I ask, uh, Jace, can you give some information on how do you do complementary? What modifications or procedures you have streamlined doing complementary uh, during these times? Uh, Jace? Sure. Uh, one thing that we did uh, when this, uh, during the, the, the outbreak was actually to have a dirt, a dirty room. So we uh, made, we used only one booth because, as Meg said, we staggered the appointments uh, as well. Uh, we sent uh, text messages saying not to bring a companion at, unless it was absolutely necessary. Um, and we did the same thing. We decreased, we really tried to decrease the appointment time to maximum 15 minutes. We gave the instructions. Uh, we did print instructions and gave to them, uh, the receptionist would give to them when they walked in. Um, so very similar. Another thing is, for example, just to avoid contact, everything was closed, nothing around with a, uh, uh, a draw or open anything like that. And we eliminated the press button so they would just put their hands up to make sure that they are not touching anything. We did change the chairs to make sure that was um, uh, cleanable. So 
Yeah, what else? Well, one thing, for example, is that uh, I, I think that we tend to forget the otoscopy, for example. I think that is the, the thing that put us uh, at risk the most because we get too close to the patient. So this was totally abolished from the ENT and audiology department from the very beginning. We, we moved to the uh, video otoscopy where you can keep the distance, you can keep your face distant. Um, yeah, so we definitely now we are as I said, back to normal, but um, we are still the distance, the information uh, about how the procedure is to not to spend time explaining the patient what you are going to do. So all this counseling and conversation that we used to have, this is, is eliminated and the patient knows this. So in the, in the, the information uh, that we give to them when they walk in, how the test is done, we say that this is to a uh, limit to decrease the time uh, that you are with the clinician for your safety and for the clinician's safety as well. Right. Uh, uh, thanks, Days. And and just to uh, add on to that, you know, we, we know that you know that the the uh, looking at the uh, external layer is little risky. And I went through a, a study stating that. Uh, uh, the dry external layer is not a virus uh, uh, bearing uh, place, but if you have a, a, a perforated tympano, uh, tym tym I mean, tympano, uh, tympanic membrane, and if your uh, your mucosa, middle layer mucosa, is exposed, and they, they can bear the uh, uh, the virus quite well. So, I mean, do you have any specific indications? You know, for these patients, you can't do tympanometry, or you know. You're going to look implementary for all the patients and how do you decide that as your uh, autologist i mean uh, stop them from sending you to implementary or how do you handle cases with the middle ear effusions or or, or a, a tympanic membrane perforation yeah this is highlighted uh by the ent and we don't we don't do the tympanometry if that is a, a, a tm perforation thank you thank you very much this thanks for this uh, information and um Next is looking at the modifications in the audiological procedure. So, you know, I would like to highlight what we do in MRF uh, uh, when it comes to the uh, ABR and OEA testing. And, uh, with, and we use the appropriate PPEs, and especially the clinicians use mask, shield, and the gloves. That's very, very important. Uh, and, they, and the patients are recommended to use the uh, mask. And if they don't bring their mask, and we have a spare mask here, and we give it to the uh, spare mask, and new mask, we give it to the patient's use. Now, what we do, we made some little changes in the way we do the APR. Uh, number one is we don't use the cloth sheets on the couch. We use the paper tissues, which is easily easy to dispose. We so one use at a time and then use it. And we give them video instructions are given through video demonstration. So we, we pre-recorded the instructions with our clinicians with captions at the bottom. And then we play this video to make them understand what this test is going to be and, and, and how they have to uh, uh, make themselves comfortable during the test and uh, with respect to the electrode options we had different uh, equipments we have almost four or five electrophysiological equipments now to do the test and each of the tests comes with a different electrode type so what we have done we have changed the complete electrode type so we don't use the cup electrodes we use the button snap electrodes and use the ecg uh, 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 surface leads to connect them to the scalp so that we can uh, the ecd ecg electrode uh, uh, lead is a use and throw uh, 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 material uh, once we use we can throw it so whereas you use a cup electrodes you have to reuse it you have to clean it so then it becomes an additional risk adds on to us these are some of the modifications that we have we have uh, uh, accommodated uh, in doing uh, abr and the oe procedure with specific to oe what we've done is you know we haven't changed much we haven't changed much i mean with the same procedure but uh, the only uh, change what we have uh, made at the moment is you know um, we keep the room open uh, uh, when we do a longer procedure. For example, when you do an ABR and OE together, sometimes the procedure takes more than 30 minutes or 40 minutes, uh, depending on the uh, state of the subject and, the, uh, and it goes case by case. We do the procedure keeping the room open and we only close the room when we do an OE. We don't keep the room uh, closed when you do an ABR, uh, especially. And apart from that, there's much, not much of a change that we have uh, incorporated in these uh, procedures. And uh, we, as, as everybody has mentioned, you know, we do not allow the caretakers inside, especially uh, adults. And when it is a child, only one parent is allowed inside. 
and even the parent has to wear the proper PPE when they come into the room. So these are some of the uh, modifications that we have done. And um, may now next ask uh, uh, Great, what what modifications that you have done in your uh, 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 clinic uh, to streamline the speech audiometry and CA fitting? Yes, so as you mentioned in your introduction, I completely agree that uh, we should not give up the standards of care, but that we should modify the services just to make sure that we protect both the patients, but also our uh, experts. So you may go to the next slide and then you can see that this also applies the audiological services and also the next slide. Um, just some examples um, that there's extra time between the patients for cleaning the headphones, the chair, the audiometer and so on. And also we reorganized the waiting room, as you can see on the picture. Um, but we also introduced tele rehabilitation wherever possible, for example, um, the monthly tinnitus retraining therapy group sessions are now organized online and um, that's a huge success, I can say. Um, also, for some of our patients, if possible, of course, we organize online hearing training after cochlear implant surgery. Um, we also did some adjustments in the audio booth to ensure that uh, our students, our audiologists in training, are able to join the audiometry consultation in a safe way. So, as you can see on the picture, there's yeah, like a plastic door in between the audiologist and the student. Uh, and if, yes, you can see it's on the picture. So, that's nice and then maybe the next slide um this is a slide on how we try to reduce the appointment time with our ci patients so for example for the activation of a speech processor before covid 19 um we explained all the different tools step by step during a two-hour appointment but today we are sending a memory stick uh, in advance to our CI patients with all the different guidelines of the use of the speech processor with all the different tools and possibilities. So now uh, there's a one hour appointment for the activation and this one is based upon in questions of the patient. So there we were possible to reduce uh, the appointment time with the patient. Then we also reduced our long term follow up program before COVID-19. All our CI patients were invited every year for follow up. But now we only invite them for a yearly basis, the first five years after activation and thereafter only in case of problems or in case of uh, a renewal of the speech processor. Our testing was already reduced to uh, based on the minimal outcome measurements. So we decided not to reduce the standard testing in our CI patients. Then I think we also have a next slide or maybe not yet here, or yes. Um, so this is just an impression on how we do our consultation with CI patients. Uh, so we use the face shields and a protection wall in order to allow the rip, lip reading as discussed earlier. Um, however, the patients, they should still keep on wearing their masks. Uh, um, information, and I have one question to Great and also uh, Meg can also uh, answer this question. Now, when, when you say that you, 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 you are scheduling patients for uh, programming, you know, you have schedules for every three months or six months or one year, whatever your protocol is. Now, owing to the situation, do you think that can you uh, do some modifications in your programming? You know, can you create a progressive map based on your evidences, what you have or on a case by case? Is it possible you can give a progressive map and load it into the speech processor and you can ask the patient to activate it, you know, at the different point of time. Will that be possible, Meg, uh, from your experience? So we haven't really modified our, our mapping procedures um, because we really believe that individualizing the settings is what's the best outcome for the patient. So at activation, you know, for you know, to take the Medel device for a, an example, um, we are measuring the comfort levels on all 12 channels, and then we are estimating the T levels at 10% of that. Um, and just applying the default, you know, the rest of the default filters, and then we will do progressively louder maps. They have 3 louder versions of that original map. And then they return for the 1 month interval and at the 1 month interval is when we are measuring the threshold levels as well. Um, and at that interval, we are also providing um, progressively louder maps with the intention that they're going to return for the three month interval. And at the three month interval is where we are really 
spending more time individualizing the map by addressing what we're seeing from the sound field measure with the aided sound field thresholds and speech recognition. Um, but we haven't adjusted um, the way that we have been approaching mapping in response to COVID just because we feel that that supports the best outcomes for patients. Thank you, Meg. Thank you very much for this information. Anya, may I take some inputs from you? Uh, what, what do you do in your Woosburg Clinic with respect to mapping? I know you're in charge of the cochlear implant program and you do a lot of uh, implantable uh, hearing devices that you perform in your clinic. Can we take some inputs from you, Anya? Um, sure. I mean, I'm pretty, we're doing pretty much the same as just Meg described in terms of um, the procedure itself and the frequency, how we see people and the way how we are programming, this remains the same. So, so there is no difference in um, the way how we actually do our work. I mean, what has changed most for us is, as you can see here on this picture, is the social distancing, but this does not affect our work. You can see here, um, I took a picture in the fitting room, one of um, our few fitting rooms, and you can clearly see that, that there is an additional table. This table, the white table, was never in there before, and it's a small room. But you can also see we have nice windows and they are open now all the time. So we have now really implemented um, the way how we can actually have the distance. And in between, we have the, um, the glass partitions. Um, in this situation where I took the picture, it's a consultation, a technical consultation before CI surgery where we present all the four manufacturers. And uh, in the end, it's the patient to decide which one he or she wants. So in this picture, my colleague, she, she's wearing a medical mask. It wouldn't, it's, it's not necessary at that point because windows open distance plus a glass partition. However, um, if she does not feel safe, it's, uh, it's her choice to keep on the mask. And um, as you can see here, there is an accompanying person. So in terms for that service, it's fine. But for the programming itself, this has not changed. But maybe we can look at this graph, yes, here. This is a situation where one of my colleagues is doing a psychological follow-up testing because we have a nice interdisciplinary program for uh, the follow-up of hearing impaired children. And so uh, on a regular intervals, there is the psycholinguistic um, status um, that is assessed and also other uh, speech uh, comprehension and so on. And as you can see here, um, the little boy has to uh, do a, a certain amount of testing. And on the right graph, you can see that the glass partition has a little hole inside. So this was necessary for my colleague uh, that she could do the testing, take off her mask while working with children and actually do her work. So this has changed. We are, as mentioned before, we are on back on nearly normal service. We have our, our um, programs in place, the special programs for adults and for children. And yeah. Thanks, Anya. And, and in, in our clinic in MERV, what we do is, you know, apart from all the uh, additional things, you know, we have introduced the e-form. So where the patient fills the electronic uh, case history form. So we have just get, got rid of the uh, uh, paper uh, uh, the case history forms and we've developed our own app where the patient can log in and fill the details and, and they can even attach their previous reports to us and that's something which we have implemented now and also the uh, we provide the uh, video consultation for basic troubleshooting and also for counseling as well and what we have done is we have developed a, a, a small video which gives instructions to the patients for every test so with captions and if you look at the captions below, and we have developed those, uh, I mean, uh, we, have, we have translated in five different languages, which is very useful for the patient nowadays. And what we do is we don't show the uh, uh, the instructions when they come to the audiology booth, just to reduce the time that they spend within the audiology booth. We send this uh, uh, video uh, uh, instruction to their WhatsApp, to their mobile phone, so where they can, while they were waiting in the waiting area, they will have a, a information about what kind of test they're going to undergo and what how they have to respond for this test so this is something which we have developed and luckily we have a lot of students and and who are uh, at home we make use of their time they developed a very good video to help us with that and also looking at the time factor now let's come to the time factor and uh, which is also very important the time factor includes the amount of time that the patient spends within the 
clinician, with the patient, and with, within the room as well. Now, I would like to direct this question to uh, uh, Dr. Sharanya. Uh, doctor, how long is the virus active in the room, both sound treated and the ventilated room? And is there a maximum period that a clinician can spend with a patient in a closed airtight sound treated room where most of the audiologists spend most of the time? And how big is the impact of appropriate ventilations? Can you please give us some information on this before we move into the next uh, topic? Yeah. Uh, well, you've asked three questions. So first of all, uh, the thing with ventilation, in a room with ventilation, I think uh, the virus is viable in a, like when it comes out in droplets. Actually, the thing is that earlier when uh, this whole uh, COVID-19 hit the world, we all thought it was only a droplet infection. But now, more recently, we are aware it's also become uh, aerosol uh, transmitted infection, which means it's so much worse. And that is why possibly it is just spreading at such a furious pace. So now when you talk about a well-ventilated room, you have to take into account also the direction of airflow, which can, uh, I think you had a beautiful slide for that also, uh, Dr. Ranjit, because that showed, uh, you know, like depending upon the direction of airflow, you can see the same uh, droplet nuclei it can even affect people a little further away than even that statutory six feet that we spoke about or two meters. But otherwise, if you're talking about the distance and the time, uh, a person has to be in contact with a potential patient uh, for under 15 minutes. And uh, in that period of time, if it is just droplet infection we're talking about, yes, the person next to this gentleman right at the front end of your screen is going to get infected. And if it's a little longer, because it can remain in the atmosphere even up to four hours. But if you're talking about aerosol, and which is what actually happens in an ill-ventilated room, then it can remain viable even for up to 86 hours. So that's the kind of worry that we will have when you're talking about your sound booth that is airtight, unless it is well-ventilated, So, which it is not going to be. So the fact is that it is very imperative there to cut down your timing to within 15 minutes. And like somebody mentioned, have those uh, indicators that show that the room has been disinfected after that. Otherwise, that itself is a potential hazard. Going back to the previous slide, um, you know, there was this, uh, there was this beautiful uh, uh, anecdote that has been talked about very much where in a uh, ill ventilated bus, which is all closed up in China, there was this single patient who was completely asymptomatic, who managed to infect 11 people. He went from point A to point B, during which time he infected eight people. From B, he went on to C when he infected two more. And the bus which he got out from at B went back to A and infected one more person who happened to sit in the seat where he had sat because the bus hadn't been disinfected in that time. So this is the impact of having no ventilation at all. And that is something we have to really keep in mind about uh, lack of ventilation when it comes to coronavirus. So you need to have uh, the room ventilated, make sure that the direction of airflow is such that it's going out and not into the room where you're going to probably have it circulating for a little more time. Uh, so, uh, so, and I think 15 minutes is possibly the maximum uh, that somebody can be inside a room with them. And uh, this is along with your face shield and with your masks and everything in place. Thanks, Dr. Shani. So, um, let me ask um, uh, Anya and Days, you know, with respect to what Dr. Sharni has told, with respect to the amount of time that the, that the clinician can spend with the patient, which she says it's not more than 15 minutes. Now, I mean, how do you disinfect the sound booth in your in your place? And do you have any protocol so far, or is it to be developed? And and uh, can you just tell us something about it? in, in case if you're practicing something on it, Anya, uh, you have. Okay. okay, I start first. Yeah. Hmm? So in terms of disinfecting the sound booth, um, this has not really changed. Um, I mean, after every patient, um, everything is clean. So this is not new to us. What is new is that we um, disinfect the whole surface uh, with a special solution. It's called Incidine. And this has been made before COVID, uh, I think, after every third patient. And it's now made after every patient. 
Um, for the sound booth itself, we have a very strong ventilation system. And I have the feeling, and this ventilation system is in the whole building, and since March, it's really high. I mean, there's a lot of noise in the floors in here, so this has changed. Um, but other than that, um, the hygienic standard that we have here in place um, is established. And uh, since there are other conditions where um, there are people that have multi-resistant um, bacteria and so on, uh, we have to deal with those patients too. Um, this has not really changed that much our procedure. I mean, we are cleaning much more. We are disinfecting our hands, I would say, much more um, than before, maybe. Um, but And we also ask the patient to disinfect their hands. So I believe this is the, the major change. But in terms of disinfecting the booth, this has been after every patient before and is still in place. Thanks, thanks, Anya. Uh, Des, do you have any quick uh, comment on it? Do you disinfect the room? How do you ventilate it? Any, any short comment? Yeah, 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 Ranjit. So we do have a pretty good uh, ventilation system as well. One thing, the only thing, as as I said during the outbreak, we did uh, one booth only to be used as the as the dirty room, as I I, I would like to call. And the procedure was the same, the cleaning the whole surface uh, between patients, what was a little bit more in, in depth than, uh, than usual. Um, I think that the only thing that we did really different is that we removed every single thing that was not necessary in the booth, we removed it. That this was a recommendation by the, the, the infection uh, department that to make sure that we we have the least things in the booth possible. Fantastic, great. And this is something which we are also uh, doing now. We have removed some of the equipments in the room. We have only used equipment which is absolutely required for the test. And uh, in fact, we even optimized, uh, 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 sorry, we even, uh, I mean, uh, optimized the, the, the size of the, uh, the equipment with respect to the room what we use. And some of our equipments are quite bulky when we, and when we have very less for the space for the patient, we move it to a bigger rooms as well. And uh, thank you very much for the information. Now I'll go on to Dr. Sharnia just to ask some little more detail. And this is the we have two different types of audiometric rooms. One is the audiometric booth, and we also have the uh, uh, sound treated uh, two room audiometric rooms as well. Now, if you look at the uh, um, uh, ventilation aspect of this this particular room, there are two different uh, uh, conditions. One is a standalone audiologic room. Another one is we also have audiometric complexes where you have five, six sound treated uh, audiometric rooms in a row. So can you please tell us how frequently we need to ventilate or can you highlight on the increase of air circulations or any modifications in the air condition to be improved the ventilation? Uh, Dr. Sharnia, can you share your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, like what we have all been told is there need to be about uh, six air changes per hour. That is roughly a one air change every 10 minutes which means that once a patient comes out of the room, you need to leave the room door open for a bit and then, uh, you know, so that there is an air change at least. And uh, I think your, uh, usually the HVAC systems that we have are all programmed to make six uh, changes per hour, uh, which is what uh, they usually do. And uh, there is an equipment that also uh, measures the airflow. Uh, which is supposed to kind of do something like about uh, 130 uh, feet or something like that, yes. But I think basically six airflow changes per hour is what we need to have to have the room properly ventilated. So which means that once in every 10 minutes, we need to keep the room ventilated. Yeah. Now, yes. how long do you think we need to ventilate? Uh, now that's a tough one. Honestly, I don't know. I need to. I need to kind of uh, find out from what people uh, what people really do. I really can't. So, which means that you know, if we have to ventilate the room for every ten minutes, that we need to yeah. streamline the procedure so that you know, within ten minutes, we 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 do the important procedures. And yeah. some of the procedures which does not require to be done in the sound treated room, we do it in a ventilated room. Exactly. For example, exactly. even when we do the conditioning, we can do the conditioning in a ventilated room. And yeah. uh, uh, for a child, we don't have to do it in the sound treated room. So when the yes. core test as testing has to be done in the in the, in the sound treated room. Yeah. And as as Meg mentioned earlier, and in case if the test is going to take a little longer time, 
we we do the test uh, a little staggered you know we give do 10 minutes and then we give a break for another 10 15 exactly. minutes and exactly. then we do the test again exactly. okay exactly. so thank you thank you very much for the information and and any modifications in the air conditioners that we what we have so what do you think because you know what kind of air conditioners we use in india because we don't use those high fi you know ventilated two way air conditioner system so no i mean i think it needs to be separated from the main uh, air conditioning system of the rest of the place that is a given but okay. beyond that i think you need to check out with uh, people who kind of set up these clean rooms i think you will need to check up with them i just checked with one of my engineer who deals with the air condition for our institute he said you know when you use a split air conditioner and a, 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 a sorry window air conditioner there is no way of ventilating them but when you use a cassette based air conditioner which is uh built on the roof i think they have a vent a small vent which is usually disabled you know we can enable it by just putting a small pipe and send an exhaust out which can increase the circulation and he also yeah. suggested if if it is a it is a centralized air condition with a duct uh, where it can monitor the uh, input and output of the air flow i think that's also a, a, a better system to ventilate the room so that's what he has suggested and i had a meeting with the one of the engineering college in chennai just uh, last week giving some lectures to them and one of the professors said you know they are building a new system which can be accommodated to the existing air conditioners which will help the room to ventilate and he hasn't explained in detail much maybe when he gets back to me and and I'll be happy to share that information to the participants over sure, sure. now let's move on to the next one how do we sterilize this uh, sound treated room you know if you look at the audiometric booth there are two types some of the rooms have acoustic tiles which is porous which has got small small holes on it and to absorb the sound and to re- reduce the reverberation and the echoes and some uh, some other rooms have got a, a carpet which is pasted on the surface now which is the most effective way of sterilizing it uh, can you help us on how do we sterilize this room uh, dr shanya yeah i think uv light is possibly the best uh, for these rooms but only thing i think your audiometry equipment has to be taken out of the room uh, because it might harm the equipment it could harm uh, some of the parts of the equipment So I think before putting on the UV light, at least for a minimum of twenty-five to thirty minutes, you need to take out the major equipment that has a risk of getting damaged. And I think the the nice thing is, I think there is a person in Chennai here who's brought up a, a kind of a movable uh, UV light system, which has four lights on its four directions, and that can be placed in the center of the room so that there's equal diffusion of the UV light into the entire room. So I think that is something that was a nice innovation that I saw in uh, ophthalmologist clinic, and I think that is something that could possibly help you all. Apart from that, for your other uh, other instruments and all of that, I think it is only cold sterilization uh, with neutraldehyde or with hydrogen peroxide, and I think that is about all that you can use. But I think. But how about how about gas sterilization, doctor? Because the UV light is restricted to the um, uh, to the areas where it can. Uh, uh, spread you know and and some areas where underneath the table where the light can't penetrate you know how do we sterilize those areas you know so when you recommend the thing. gas uh, chemical uh, sterilization in those conditions yeah your uh, your neutraldehyde i think uh, could be used neutraldehyde or hydrogen peroxide duration that uh, uh, we need to sterilize the room yeah and I is it, is it something related to the size of the room or uh, no you need to keep it on for a minute minimum of 30 seconds to 10 minutes uh if you need to sterilize you can't keep it for shorter duration than that and i think 10 minutes would be ideal but do you, in that case do you recommend to use the uv sterilization after every 10 minutes when we see the patient or between the, uh, between two patients if it's going to be for 5 10 minutes i think it's possible for the audiologist to do it Yeah, I think well, it's better to err on the side of safety, Doctor Ranjit. Uh, I mean, like if y'all can do it, do it. Okay, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Now, um, now, what preventive measures uh, or changes has been necessary to disinfect the audiological equipment? Let's go back to the equipment aspect of it. Now, we've been looking at the room and uh, the thing, and let's look at the equipment. Great, can you share some of your thoughts on how do you? disinfect the audiological equipments and instruments in your clinic um during yes. this covid time yeah i think our procedures with respect to the disinfections are a little bit in line with the procedures anya and daisy already mentioned 
Uh, of course, in the first step, we clean our hands as instructed by the WHO. Uh, but then for speech processors and other materials like the headphones and chairs and everything, we uh, use alcohol-based wipes or spray. And these um, wipes or sprays, they contain at least 70% of alcohol. That's, yeah, that's what I can say about the wipe. Yeah, uh, Dr. Sharni, I would like to ask you uh, with respect to uh, the sterilization procedure of the equipments. You know, we have uh, two types of equipments. One is the equipment that goes in contact with the patient. There are some equipments which are not in contact with the patients. You know, for example, you take the headphones that, that comes in contact with the patients. Uh, when, you, when you use a, 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 just an audiometer or a laptop that you use to retype your report, doesn't go in direct contact with the patient. So uh, how do we clean it? Is there a different procedures that we need to follow? And what is the difference between sterilization and sanitization? So can you just highlight on it and what equipment to be sterilized and what equipment to be just sanitized, not sterilized? Sterilization is a complete uh, killing of all the organisms that are there. So if you are going to have any equipment that is in direct contact with the patient, with organic material, uh, blood, mucus, any spills, then yes, you need to sterilize it. But if you need to disinfect it, it's just is sanitizing it and rendering it uh, non-infective. So that is how you're talking about it. And uh, I think here, uh, for those things that are in contact with the patient, definitely you need to uh, uh, sterilize it. And like I mentioned earlier, the best methods of sterilization are your phone sterilization. And as uh, Meg said just now, I think the rest of it can just be sanitized using your uh, wipes, alcohol-based wipes. Thank you, thank you very much. And and what do you what is your take on this? See, we have this small UV uh, sterilization chamber in our clinic, and uh, we put all the small instruments in this chamber, and then we use the uh, UV chamber to sterilize uh, for five minutes to seven minutes. So, do you think it's a good thing to do, or do you think it's uh, it doesn't have it's, it's not very effective? No, no, it's a very good thing to do, and in fact, there are uh, some people who even brought this out with a kind of a a kind of a plastic uh, kind of a shield in between, a kind of a partition in between, so which the light both the surfaces of the objects that are placed on that uh, partition. So you have a light from below as well as from above. So that it is completely sterilized and this i think is happening uh not only for uh, uh small things that you are sterilizing also it's being already used in ophthalmology where i know that uh, some of the leading ophthalmologists are doing this so i think it's a great thing that you all have started it's also being used incidentally now for currency notes because that is a source of infection too so they have a particular chamber like this for currency notes right uh, thank you, thank you, Dr. Sharnia. And uh, this, I think we have already discussed about this particular side. Even Anya spoke about it. Uh, that you know what kind of uh, modifications that they do uh, to uh, to improve communication, especially with uh, patients with hearing impairment. That has been already discussed. So we'll move on to the next uh, uh, thing, Dr. Sharnia. This is the last question for you. Uh, can you tell us uh, something about the virus load and its impact uh, on on the uh, when uh, and its impact on health? That's question number one. And question number two is a very, very important question. You know, what precautions and prevention, preventive measures the clinicians need to take to prevent their families? Because one of the biggest concerns for all the clinicians, those who come to work, is you know, when they go back from work to home and they don't want to infect their family members are uh, 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 there. So when what kind of precautions? Because this has been a very important scare for most of my clinicians, even coming for coming for work. So how do you install confidence in them? Okay, uh, talking about the virus load, the larger the virus load, uh, it's going to have a greater impact on the health. And uh, see, uh, and it's not only going to have a greater impact on the health of the person having the high virus load, it's also going to have a greater impact on the health of the person receiving that uh, virus that is shed in a sneeze or a cough, or even the spittle that when somebody is speaking. So I think, uh, and, but one thing, one, one thing has to be taken in consideration. Uh, we have seen people with very high viral loads, though, this, though the RT-PCR that we do is not a quantitative uh, technology, it is only qualitative and we give the report as negative and positive. We have what is called the cycle threshold, which tells us when the virus, uh, the viral RNA actually starts amplifying. So the lower the viral, uh, the lower the cycle threshold is, the higher the viral load is. 
So we are able to have a rough assessment of how the viral load is in a patient who comes in for testing. And the strange thing is, it's not always that the person with a high viral load uh, is even symptomatic. They are fine. They are absolutely fine. And so it comes as a surprise to us. In fact, we have taken a repeat sample from some of them because they are so well. So a lot also depends on the immune status of the person having the infection, as well as the comorbidities that may or may not exist in that person. So viral load alone cannot be taken into isolation, but by and large, the greater the viral load, the greater its impact on the patient as well as the person receiving the infection. And uh, considering that here we have a lot of asymptomatic cases, I think we need to think that everybody has a high viral load and that we are going to inhale that high viral load and stay careful at all times. Which brings me to the second question that you mentioned about what we need to do to protect ourselves to in order to protect our families. And I think here, I think uh, we need to be very judicious about who we actually see in the clinic as a starting point. Then follow all the protect, uh, preventive measures that were mentioned earlier by every speaker, starting from uh, hand sanitizing, uh, temperature checks of everybody who enters your clinic, making sure that everybody wears on masks when they enter the clinic. Finally, making sure that you are well protected when you're handling the patient with whatever level of protection you need, making sure about that, making sure you hand uh, wash your hands thoroughly all the time, any number of times to almost become obsessive about hand washing, making sure that you don't touch your face, your hand, your mouth, all of that, uh, you know, don't allow your, uh, even by mistake, to touch your eyes or your nose or your mouth unnecessarily. And... Uh, I think uh, the other simple thing is like uh, you need to make sure that when you leave the workplace to go home and you've taken off your PPE, make sure that when you go home, your clothes are removed at the, as the first thing you do when you get home. Keep them soaking uh, in a separate bucket for a while before they are washed. Wash them separately and have a bath before you actually interact with the rest of your family. I think that is something uh, that uh, we all need to do and we make sure that we are safe so that our families are also safe. Very much, Dr. Thanks for all the valuable inputs. Now I request um, uh, Professor Dr. Mohan Kameshwaran, sir. So what do you think the audiological services are most important from the autologist's point of view? So you have heard the whole presentation for last uh, uh, one and a half, one and a half, 45 minutes or so. And also please give your final remarks on this uh, whole meeting, sir. Uh, Anjit, I think it's an excellent meeting. <clears throat> you know, I learned a lot. Um, I think this is, uh, uh, you know, uh, something which is going to be very important for uh, not only audiologists, but for autologists as well. Uh, as you know very well, you know, we can't do a, a carry on an autological service without support of the autological services. So there are several situations like in the last three months that I have desperately, you know, uh, asked for help from you. Uh, you know, patients who come with uh, sudden hearing loss, patients who come post meningitis, uh, patients who had, uh, you know, uh, uh, many many uh, clinical situations where the hearing is affected, and where you can't delay or you can't postpone. Also, similarly, uh, you know, patients with who implantees who have had their devices uh, failing for what whatever reason. It could be some problem with the device or, you know, uh, some more serious problems, but whatever it is, uh, each of these calls for an, an immediate response from the clinician. So that the autologist and audiologist have been in it together. But what's important, I think, is to give the message that while we are giving the service, we are also protecting uh, the safety of the personnel and the uh, patient both. So to prevent cross infection, uh, in the uh, uh, center, and also to ensure that uh, you know we're all safe, and we go home safe, and we keep our families safe. So I think you've given a, a wonderful overview of the whole situation. I'll just uh, maybe you know summarize a few take-home points which I learned from this. So I think this will be a good summary for the whole thing. Uh, we we started off by saying that you know globally we have affected the audiological services everywhere, but and fear of the patients uh, to come to the center has been one of the important factors. So we need to reassure them. Uh, also, the, uh, we, we, you, you quite nicely prioritize what's important. Uh, the panelists 
prioritize that newborn screening is very important that uh, hearing aid fitting, uh, cochlear implant uh, troubleshooting are all very important and they can't be delayed unnecessarily. Uh, you also talked about uh, the importance of initial activation, not, not uh, going beyond a month, and uh, also talking about uh, the importance of the first month appointment post uh, activation. Uh, I, I think some very important messages, uh, clear messages have been given particularly with regard to safety of the personnel, uh, the importance of PPEs, I think it can never be underestimated. This is a new norm, it's a new world we're going to live in. And even if, uh, you know, we come out of the, the uh, peak, it, this is going to be there for the foreseeable future, as uh, in my opinion. So all of us have to learn to wear masks all the time, ensure that the patient also wears a mask, the attender wears a mask, social distancing and maintain frequent hand washing. These are all going to be the new you're not going to get out of that. Uh, staggering appointments, maintaining social distancing in waiting areas, disinfection, uh, and particularly, uh, you know, starting off with uh, the first point of entry, uh, questionnaires to be filled up, maybe electronically before they even come, and uh, temperature screening, uh, uh, hand disinfection at the point of first uh, entry into the in center. Uh, maintaining uh, distancing with glass partitions wherever possible and uh, importance of PPE for the audiologist and the patient. I think all this has been covered very well. Uh, I think Dr. Charanya very nicely said that two meters social distancing is, is important, but it's not absolutely safe. Uh, the importance of aerosolization uh, is very, very important. So, you know, uh, you have to ensure you have to be realistic and realize that. Uh, in uh, soundproof uh, booths, ventilation has to be uh, you know, ensured. And if you're going to be using uh, booths, then if you can rotate the patient between booths if, uh, and sterilize them in between, that will be great. Importance of UV uh, sterilization you all mentioned. I think uh, that seems to be a very practical way of doing it. And also gas sterilization if you can rotate between the booths. So I think uh, you know you you have uh, more or less covered the whole spectrum of events, uh, and uh, the the message is clear: start your services in a staggered fashion, after ensuring that you have systems in place to maintain safety, uh, both at workplace and uh, you know uh, when you go home after your work. Uh, it doesn't mean that you have to be uh, you know uh, avoiding work and sitting at home because that doesn't help. Uh, sooner or later, all of us have to go back to work and, and get back to normalcy. And we can't defer doing our uh, responsibilities forever. But we have to do it uh, in a phased manner. We also have to do it in a safe manner. Uh, and uh, that's the caribou message, I think, uh, that, you know, audiological services are important. Uh, you need to do that, but please ensure that, you know, you do it in a responsible way, in a safe way. And I think uh, all the panthers have been exemplary, you know, been wonderful listening to every one of you. Uh, it's been a real learning experience, uh, and I must thank uh, every one of you and you, Ranjit, for uh, you know for getting this organized. A special thanks to uh, Professor Bongartner, Bomi as we call him, very affectionately, you know, for the, the president of the uh, hearing group for getting this whole thing uh, on track. I think he's done a wonderful job getting this, uh, uh, you know, moving. And also to Peter uh, for uh, you know the technical support and, and organization. So overall, it's been a very educative learning experience, Ranjit. I'm sure every uh, attendee, and I see a number of them, would have benefited from this. I certainly have learned quite a bit. Uh, gives me uh, you know more confidence that uh, I think services will be back to normal soon. Uh, let's uh, keep our fingers crossed, but let's also all be safe. So thank you all. God bless you. Please be safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sir. And um, before we move on to the next thing, um, yeah. So and 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 but thank you very much for the excellent summary, sir. You have summarized the whole meeting in 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 three minutes for the last two hours and three minutes. Thank you very much. So at the end of the day, what is more important is streamline your own procedures and uh, based on the uh, on few important aspects. One is reduce the contact duration at the facility, reduce the contact with the patient, with the clinician, avoid crowded areas, reduce contact areas, optimize distance between patients and between the clinicians as well. 
and improved hygiene. So with all these things in place, we can streamline uh, most of the procedures. So what we have done is we have highlighted some of the important streamlining methods that we have been uh, doing in the last three months, like proteinodiometry, ABR, tympanometry, and uh, other things. But uh, we can also extend it for uh, procedures like, you know, hearing aid fitting, hearing aid optimization. But by and large, and it will be the same, almost the same. You will have to take care of the hygiene, the distance, and the durations. These are the three things. So, and, and to, to conclude, and I would like to quote um, our great friend Mario Zernotti. Two days ago, he sent a post in his uh, Twitter with uh, his picture doing a uh, cochlear implant surgery, which I quite like this quote because this is something what Mohan Commissioner and Sir keeps on telling uh, quite often. This pandemic is not an excuse to relax. It's a time to work harder and more carefully for our patients with strictest protocol. And the protocols that we build today during this uh, unfortunate situations will be the best protocols with improved hygiene and also very good disciplined methods which will actually save more patients in the future than we, what we are saving now. This is a very good opportunity for us to build uh, uh, more protocols because as uh, uh, great as uh, earlier mentioned, as Vincent Churchill has already told that, you know, uh, never lose a crisis, make use of the crisis, make the best out of the crisis. I think we should make the maximum out of this present crisis what we're going through. And, and finally, and the outcome of this uh, entire meeting will be in a form of publications, which will be useful for all the, uh, uh, professionals all over the world to refer to, and they can also use it as a, 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 a modified, I mean, a modified protocol, and they can also re-modify to suit their environment, to suit their clinic as well in the future. But I hope this will form a good reference for the professionals, and the um, we will also upload this presentation in the hearing website, and this is the hearing website here, and for people, those who uh, want to uh, listen to it again, and for people, those who couldn't join the meeting today, we'll always have this source available in there. Uh, hearing.com. With this, I would like to thank all my panelists, Tom Gartner, all my panelists for taking the time out and spending uh, uh, the fruitful time for us. And also thank Peter Grasso uh, and E, who has been working with me for the last three weeks on preparing these materials and helping me out, sorting out the surveys and etc. Thank you very much, Peter and uh, uh, E for this. And I also like to thank uh, uh, the participants and the team of uh, MERF institute which has been supporting me uh, to do this program and, and i sincerely thank all the participants for spending their time out i hope this was useful and then we'll soon come out with the recommendations based on it uh, thank you very much and uh, uh, stay safe stay healthy and stay with more uh, confidence thank you very much